All right, hello everyone. Uh, to the session about, uh, I call it next gen CICD with uh, GitOps and progressive delivery. Uh, I'm Kevin Dubois, uh, and I'm a, I'm a developer advocate at Red Hat. Uh, je parle aussi un peu de français, mais uh, on va faire la, la session en anglais quand même. Uh, voilà. Who, uh, who recognizes this? Um, FileZilla, you know, that's how we used to deliver, right? <laughs> Just uh, copy our files over and, uh, you know, it's live on, on production. That's, uh, that's how I started too back in the day, you know, like, uh, you know, some random PHP application that we would uh, deploy, even a cold fusion application. Um, and we would use, uh, you know, just like shared drives and windows and everything to, to collaborate. So, you know, the good old days, <laughs> not really. Um, and then uh, we became more uh, advanced over the years and, uh, you know, like started using Git and uh, deploying our application to a server and R syncing them and everything. And um, yeah, of course, we got called in the middle of the night <laughs> to try to fix issues. So uh, this talk is about you know how can we do delivery, of course, in a better way using uh, you know modern CI/CD practices and GitOps, Kubernetes, uh, and uh, and progressive delivery, which really kind of uh, automates everything even nicer. So um, I don't know if you've seen this kind of thing, the the developer flow. Uh, where you know you're developing on your local machine in your inner loop, so you know you do your coding, your testing, and everything. And at some point, you know, let's say it's good enough, and um, we're gonna create a pull request or a merge request. And at that point, you go into let's what we call the outer loop, where more autom autom automation is uh, is happening. You know, so we do CI/CD, we do uh, delivery of our application, maybe some uh, security tests. Uh, checks, compliance checks, and everything, and then you know at some point we go to production. So the kind of difference between an inner loop and the and the outer loop uh, is the inner loops more like the, our local development, whether it's in the cloud or uh, on our local IDE, and then the outer loop is everything that's outside of you know the development uh, cycle itself. Um, so today with this talk we're focusing on the outer loop, and so you know how it used to be. Uh, we had one big monolith that we would uh, deliver, so it's fairly easy, right? Aside from, you know, everybody has to be coordinated and everything, but, you know, you kind of, hey, ops, the, deliver my application, and, uh, and we're done, um, you know, aside from there being maybe issues and everything. With distributed applications, with microservices and everything, we have more granular deployments. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of this kind of uh, model, but that also means that to deliver your application, you have you know different uh, pipelines for each application, right? So you have these little tubes there that represent pipelines, and so you know you need to manage everything, and you don't want to do that manually, right? You want to have automation in place for your pipelines, for your delivery, and everything. So there's not you know somebody that has to go and approve everything and manually push things or configure things. Um, so you know CI/CD helps with that. So I have CI/CD CD here uh, because well you have CI which is you know like your regular continuous integration where you're going to do your builds and your tests and create your artifacts and then uh, at some point you'll deploy to staging and production. And so you do continuous delivery and deployment. The main difference between the two essentially being that uh, with continuous delivery, um, you have kind of a manual step. So you're, uh, you're ready to go to production. You're, you have your, uh, uh, your deployment ready, um, production ready, but you're not actually going to production. You have like a manual step. Somebody needs to say, okay, we're gonna actually release uh, to production, and then continuous deployment means you're really automated to the point where you know you're going to go as soon as well, let's say your merge or your pull request is approved, everything is going to do uh, go automatically and go to production. Uh, you know, kind of as its uh, last step of this automated uh, cycle. So. Um, I'm going to demonstrate a continuous delivery a little bit uh, with a racing game. So you're going to be uh, participating, hopefully, in this game. Uh, I don't know if you've, uh, you've already participated in this game before. If you were in, uh, in a previous session with me, I do this. I've been doing this uh, for a few months now, but it's still uh, a lot of fun. 
Um, so basically this game, uh, I, I'll have this dashboard, we have two race cars, and um, you'll uh, scan a QR code and you'll see the, what, what you see on the left on your phone, so this windmill to create green energy to power your car, right? And so you're gonna be divided into two teams kind of randomly, and um, you're gonna tap on your phone to create power energy for these cars. So the architecture of this game, so it's a, it's a game uh, running Quarkus. So who is uh, familiar with Quarkus here? Okay, so we got good, let's say, 30, 40% of the audience. So Quarkus, uh, for those who don't know, is uh, a Java runtime that uh, is, makes Java a lot uh, faster to start up and use uh, less memory and, and all that stuff. Uh, so it's a really cool project for cloud-native deployments and for serverless uh, Java, right? Because you have a very fast startup time, actually even faster than, uh, than Node.js, which is, which is pretty cool. Uh, so this game is written in Quarkus, and um, so basically every time you tap, you create uh, a REST request that uh, the application is going to uh, receive. It's going to uh, put it in a Kafka topic, and then uh, I'm going to read it on my dashboard. I'll read all these events, and then uh, that's how we're going to make these cars move. So um, if you're ready, hopefully my QR code works. <laughs> I tested it a little bit ago, so hopefully it's still, uh, it's still working. It's not. Oh, wow. That was interesting. <laughs> I'm like, wait, it's not working. Okay, so uh, you should see like waiting for game if everything goes well. So, you know, scan a QR code. I'll uh, wait just a minute for everybody to uh, have a moment. And then, uh, yeah, a few more people. Okay, so I'm gonna go to my dashboard here. So I have the dashboard right here, and uh, oh, network failure. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> Seems to be working. Okay, so I have my dashboard here, and I can see there's uh, players loading into the game, right? So it looks like we have team one with 40 players and team two with 40 players, so we got a nice even game, it wouldn't matter anyway because it's the average of all the players. So, uh, you know, so that also means if you uh, scan the QR code, please play because otherwise you're dragging the rest of your team down, right? So, uh, if everybody's ready, I'm going to start the game and then, you know, just uh, tap on your phone to, uh, to play the game. All right. Go, 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 go. Tap, 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 tap. We've got a pretty even uh, race going on. Looks like team one is slightly, now team two, so it's very even. Keep tapping, keep tapping, you're almost there. Team two is in the lead, so team one needs to tap a little bit faster. And our game is lagging. There it goes, oh, team two won. Good job, team two. <laughs> and uh, who was player with, uh, with the username Delry? Good job, you're the best tapper, congratulations. You get a Quarka sticker. <laughs> All right, so why am I playing this game? Of course, we're going to be uh, releasing a new feature, right? So uh, I'll go back to my slides. And uh, so what if we added a new feature? So um, this tapping is fun, but like we're creating green energy with wind turbines and everything. So instead of tapping, in our next version of the game, we're going to shake our phone uh, to power the car. Okay, so I'm going to release this new feature, but I'll first tell you a little bit about, you know, like the mechanics and how I'm going to do that using uh, uh, Tekton and Argo CD as the, as the underlying technology for the CI CD and GitOps. Um, so if I'm developing, you know, that's, uh, that's my, my way of developing. I'm working throughout the week and then uh, 5 p.m. on a Friday, I'm like, all right, uh, I'm done, feature complete, push, and uh, ops, take it away. And Ops is like, come on, seriously, Kevin, again? Now, you know, if, and you know what happens, right? So then uh, Friday night, we got uh, issues. Everybody gets called in the middle of the night. Uh, and so, well, of course, we want to avoid that kind of scenario, right? We want to automate everything. Uh, so if we go back to the developer flow, um, 
well, we're focusing on the outer loop, right? So especially the build and the deploy. So you can see the build with the cute little Tomcat. So that's the logo of, uh, of Tekton. And we got uh, the cute little uh, squid too, and that's the logo of Argo CD. So those are the two projects uh, we'll be talking about in this first part. And then uh, once uh, we've released a new feature, we'll talk a little bit about progressive delivery as well. Um, so cloud native CI CD, um, so for, do, for those of you who are familiar with, uh, with Jenkins and everything, um, you have a big beefy server with lots of plugins that you need to configure and everything. So you know, that's not really ideal if you want to create you know, re, uh, uh, pipelines that you can recreate, that you can duplicate, that you can reuse and everything. So um, cloud native CI CD basically means that you're using uh, containers, not just for specific tasks in, uh, in your pipeline, but actually for your pipeline as a whole. You're using Kubernetes and uh, custom resources in Kubernetes to be able to use uh, to do pipelines. And so ideally, you want to use serverless, so you just define your pipeline. You're not actually using resources until you need to use them, right? So once you're kicking off your pipeline, then you'll scale up some container that runs its task and then scale back down so you're not actually using any resources if you don't need to. So that's really you know, cloud-native serverless CI CD that you can do with uh, Tekton. So Tekton is a project that uh, is a part of the CD foundation. Um, you know, Red Hat is a contributor as well as you know, Google, uh, IBM CloudBeast, so the people behind uh, Jenkins are also contributors to uh, to Tekton, and uh, you know it's a pretty cool project to be able to use Kubernetes for CI/CD in a very manageable and reusable way. So some uh, concepts, real quick about Tekton. Um, so you basically have tasks and steps, and so basically with a task you define a certain you know set of steps that you want to run. Uh, in a container, so it could be like a git clone or a, or a maven install or something. Um, and so in a task, you can have multiple steps, right? So to, to combine them into one deployable unit. And then tasks are grouped together in a definition in a pipeline. And so the pipeline is a group of tasks which consist of different steps. And so that's you know the, the main concepts of, of Tekton. Then you have the implementation of a pipeline which is a pipeline run. So that's when you're actually running a pipeline because the pipeline is just a definition. And then uh, task run is, you know, of course, the implementation, the running component of, of a task. So here's a very simple example of, uh, you know, of course, Kubernetes, YAML, right, uh, of a pipeline. So you can see here, you know, you have your kind pipeline, and then uh, you have a set of tasks. Um, so, for example, in this one, while well, we just have a git clone, typically you'll have a few more tasks, right? And then uh, you have, you can specify uh, parameters that can be uh, added to your pipeline, so you don't have to recreate pipelines. You can reuse pipelines for different uh, projects for, uh, and, and just supply, for example, a different git repository in this case, so you can reuse that one. And then same with tasks, you can add different parameters. And then you also see workspaces, which is basically um, a way to persist uh, between tasks, right? Because it is serverless, so once a task is done running, it, the container disappears, it uh, gets terminated. So you probably want to keep your artifact, once you've built it, uh, to your next step where maybe you're building a container image with that artifact, right? You don't want to rebuild the artifact that you've already built. So you can save that in a workspace and then carry it over to the next uh, task. Um, so speaking of those tasks, so you don't need to recreate and re reinvent the wheel. So there's a Tekton hub where you can go and find a bunch of already predefined tasks. So uh, you know, there's uh, we can go look at it, uh, Tekton hub. Um, you can see, you know, there's a whole bunch of pre-created tasks for you to use, and then you can customize them or whatever. So you probably have, uh, you know, Maven, uh, Maven commands and uh, it's, uh, Git clone or whatever. I mean, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of tasks out there to be able to use um, and then customize. And so basically a task defines a container image that you're going to use 
to run your specific code in. So it might be a base image that already has Maven and everything installed, and then you might run a have want to run specific Maven commands. Um, so and Tecton also has a CLI that you can use to you know run everything and uh, and kick everything off in some sort of automated script or whatever. Um, or you can just call, you know, create a webhook that you can call from your Git repository to kick everything off. So moving on, so that's the CI/CD, the cloud native CI/CD part. Uh, but we also need an automated way to deploy everything, right? So not just uh, your application, but also your configuration and everything, and then monitor your cluster to make sure that everything is exactly how you've defined it. So what is GitOps basically? A as the name says, and I'm sure most of you have heard of GitOps in the meantime, but it basically means you know Git is your single source of truth for everything in your application. So in terms of you know configuration, uh, where your uh, container image is uh, stored, and everything, and so that means that you know as Git is your single source of truth, you can treat everything as code the way that you're used to with your with your applications. Uh, so you can use, you know, merge requests and uh, code reviews, and uh, you can also see who made a change to your cluster, to your configuration, to your application, who, d you know, like who created the deployment, uh, when did they do that, what was changed, and so you have an exact uh, trail, audit trail of, uh, you know, what's going on. Plus, it also means that because uh, GitOps is checking these uh, configurations, it means that you know, your cluster is also defined in Git, so you know exactly how everything is defined. So the difference between um, CICD and GitOps is essentially that with CICD, you have kind of a, a one-way street, right? So you go through different steps and tasks, you might run them parallel or whatever, but you know, there's an end to it, right? So at the end of your pipeline, it stops and, and that's it. With GitOps, it's actually monitoring constantly your cluster, your configuration, and making sure that whatever you have defined matches with what's actually you know, running in, uh, in your production environment. Um, and if it's not, if somebody goes in, you know, I go into the cluster, start playing around with it, uh, well, GitOps is going to notice that and either reset it automatically based on what I have defined as a configuration, or it's going to notify somebody saying like, hey, there's a mismatch between what you have de defined as the desired state and what's actually running. And, you know, it's Kevin. It's always Kevin who did that. Um, so, uh, so GitOps is a very handy to, you know, have visibility and to automate your, uh, your deployments. So um, you have an implementation of GitOps, which is, uh, which is Argo CD which does exactly that, right? It's a declarative GitOps continuous delivery tool for Kubernetes. You have, for example, also a Flux CD. Um, you know, we at Red Hat use Argo CD, but you know, they're all pretty good solutions. Um, and so you can define your application configuration, but potentially also entire cluster configurations um, and all versioned in Git so you know exactly uh, what's happening. And then uh, you know, GitOps and Argo CD, automatically syncs your configuration and constantly monitors, and then you can define whether you want to automatically uh, sync your changes or you want to have you know, some sort of notification system and then you know, do like a, a little manual step. And so it does drift detection to make sure that somebody is not making changes. Or maybe, you know, like when we released that feature on a Friday night and there was an issue and we went and hot fixed it on production. And then uh, next time we released, we forgot that we did that fix and stuff like that. So the nice thing with GitOps is that that wouldn't happen because uh, Argo CD would notice that there's a drift, there's a, there's a mismatch between the different environments. So if you want to apply your fix, you're still going to have to go through Git and define it so that we can still see what was changed, who changed it, and why it was changed. So that's uh, pretty nice. So let's deploy our new feature, right? Our, our shaking feature with this, uh, you know, kind of uh, GitOps and CI/CD in mind. So uh, I'm going to do some really hardcore live coding right now. I hope you're ready for this. So we're going to develop our new feature. So uh, I'm going to go straight to GitHub. <laughs> And uh, I have my file here. So this is my project here. So there's a quinoa wind turbine. And um, so I work on this with, uh, with some colleagues. And so we have our source. 
in our front end, we have a web UI, and I'm not a front end guy, by the way, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let somebody else develop this, they already did that, and they created a feature flag for me. So all I have to do with my very complicated development here, live on stage, true, tapping, false. So I'm enabling shaking and I'm disabling tapping. So you can't cheat, everybody has to shake, no more tapping. Okay, so, and as a, as a good developer, I'm gonna commit my changes directly to the main branch, no code reviews or anything, boom, done. <laughs> Anyway, so there's a, there's a webhook here that triggered uh, a pipeline. So I have a webhook configured here in, uh, in, uh, in uh, GitHub, and I have a pipeline. In this case, I'm running it on, uh, on OpenShift. So OpenShift has uh, Tekton uh, integrated in its platform so you can install it as an operator, and then uh, it's nicely embedded in, uh, in your UI, but you can also use Tekton on any other Kubernetes. Um, and so here I have my pipeline, and you can see it's actually running, right? So we have a pipeline definition, and then a pipeline run, which as you remember maybe is the implementation of a pipeline where it's actually doing the run. And so you can see here, we're doing a git clone, now we're doing a, a Maven uh, settings and then a Maven uh, package. Then we're gonna use Builda to build our container image with the new version. I'm gonna push it to a Quay repository, and then what I'm gonna do also is I have another repository which is called the Quinoa Wind Turbine Manifests. Um, oops, I have to go to it. I clicked on the wrong link here. And uh, yeah, so you can find all this uh, source code in my, uh, in my Git repository as well. So in my manifest, I have the definition of uh, the deployment of the application and uh, also my Argo CD application, so everything is automated. And so if we go look at my uh, Kubernetes manifest, we can see that there's a deployment, there's a route, there's a service, fairly simple for my application, and I have a customized file where I have a digest. Uh, I hope this is big enough, if not, I can make it a little bigger. And so basically, I have here uh, where my container image is at, uh, pointing at the exact uh, tag um, that, uh, that I pushed last time. And so I'm gonna update this automatically at the end of my pipeline to uh, my manifest and my configuration, and then that is going to be um, monitored by my GitOps, and it's gonna notice a change, and then uh, we're gonna be deploying our new features. So let's look at our pipeline here. So we have uh, our Maven uh, install that was uh, successful. Now we're creating the container image. We can go look at uh, logs here. We can see that, yeah, it sure uh, successfully tagged and pushed my image to Quay. And um, now it's updating my uh, manifest. And so that's happened just now. And if we go look now here, and I refresh in uh, GitHub, we can see that image digest was updated now, right? So our pipeline updated the uh, tag to this uh, new uh, uh, SHA-256, and so if I go look in my uh, Quay repository, we can see that a new tag was pushed a few seconds ago. And so because of that, and um, we have uh, Argo CD here, it's noticing that, hey, you made a change, and so we're gonna sync everything. So you can see here, pods are being created, so I'm rolling out my new features. So everything went automatically after I committed my change, right? So we went through tests and everything, maybe not so many tests, <laughs> you probably wanna add a little more, uh, do some security checks and everything, and then uh, we're gonna automatically release this new feature, which is happening right now in a rolling uh, fashion. And um, if we look at our pods, we can see that they're about all uh, changed over to our new version. And then uh, once that happens, we're gonna play our new uh, version of our game. So we'll go back to the slides here. So I did my live coding. You all were very impressed with my coding skills, right? Uh, so just to recap the application delivery model that we were using here. So this is an example of how you could use it. Uh, so we have our Git repository where I had my code. I made a code change, uh, went through our continuous integration pipeline and pushed an image to our registry. Then, um, well, we may have done a pull request um, for our manifest folder, or in this case, we had our CI automatically update the image. 
and that triggered uh, GitOps to update the configuration, notice that there is a drift, and then deploy the new feature automatically because it wants to uh, change my desired state to my actual state, right? So that's, uh, that's what happened. Um, so let's see if it worked. So uh, you can, I think you can refresh it or you can scan the code again, and then you should see, hopefully, that it says enable shaking. And if somebody can confirm that it says enable shaking, okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, anybody else that wants to play along? So uh, be careful once uh, we start the game. So you need to shake your phone, so hang on to it tight because I don't want to have any injuries. You've thrown phones at me or anything, even though maybe you might want to. But <laughs> Okay, so if everybody's ready, we're going to go back to our game. I'm going to refresh it. So our new feature was deployed. Now log in. Come on, log in. Ah, let me click on the button. <laughs> what the hell? Okay. So we're loading our players. We got 40 against 39. So somebody flaked out. Somebody doesn't want to play. That's <laughs> okay. So if everybody's ready, again, hang out to your phone, but shake it really good. Three, two, one. Okay, shake. Now I'm going to just take a quick picture. <laughs> OK, wow, this is going really fast. Team two is in the lead. Whoa, this was a really close one again. So good job, everybody. Team two in particular, you all get Quarkus stickers. <laughs> and uh, let's see, who was Toyama? Wow, you're very good at, uh, at shaking your phone. <laughs> all right. so. That was an example of how we can use uh, CI/CD and uh, and GitOps to deploy a new version of a game, right? So uh, we can uh, automate things pretty well. But by default, if we use this uh, strategy, um, it's kind of a big bang release, right? So I release my new feature, and automatically everything was rolling out to the new version. Um, but what if I want to only release to a subset? You know, what if something goes wrong and I need to roll back? You know, so now I've rolled it out to everybody, and everybody sees uh, errors potentially if something didn't go right, and um, you know, so all my users are affected. So what we want to do is to have a more progressive way of uh, of releasing and rolling out. Um, so that's where progressive delivery comes into the picture. So we can do step by step releases in an automated way. So we're not you know, like uh, doing things too manually, depending on how far you want to go with progressive delivery. So what is progressive delivery? Um, essentially, it means that you're not doing a big bang release of one version to the other. You're doing a, you know, a progressive release. Um, so, and that also means that a deployment, even to production, does not necessarily mean a release to production. So you can deploy your application to production and not actually it being used by uh, your users yet, and then gradually you know, introduce it to your, uh, a subset of your users. Um, and so you're going to rely on metrics, ideally, to see you know, if we release it to a certain subset of users, how is my application behaving in production? Um, and is there, you know, based on the metrics that we're seeing, is everything going well or not? You know? And we want to use metrics. We don't necessarily want to go and manually you know, change everything or you know, check everything. Um, so we're going to release to a subset of, uh, of users. So why would we want to use pro progressive delivery? Um, well, of course, to decrease downtime, right? So if we release to everybody at the same time and there's an issue, well, then we have definitely downtime uh, of all our users and our, uh, our managers and our business users are not going to be very happy. So with this strategy, we're going to be able to decrease the downtime and limit the tragedy of a release, especially if you're doing it on a, on a Friday night. Um, and so that also allows us to deploy and release to production um, faster because we have more confidence in our releases, in the quality of what's being released. Um, and we have more confidence that, you know, we release it's to a subset. Yeah, somebody might still be affected, potentially, but not everybody. So, you know, we have more confidence in our releases. And it also means that, you know, we need to do perhaps less mocking of, uh, of everything and setting up kind of unreliable fake services in, uh, in lower environments where we're not running on production to try to 
fake and, and uh, uh, mimic what's actually happening in, in production because we can use production as a testing environment. Um, so let's look at some delivery techniques of how we can uh, accomplish this. So the first one, which is essentially what we've already done, is a blue-green deployment, right? So it's an all or nothing. Uh, you, d you release a new version, it's not being used yet. Uh, well, you deploy a new version, it's not being used yet, and then uh, at some point you move tra traffic over to your newer version, and uh, hopefully everything goes well, but if not, you can roll back pretty easily to your previous version because it's still um, around. So that's the blue-green deployment. A better way, of course, is to do canary uh, releases where you're going to uh, release to a, s a subset of your users and then gradually increase the adoption of, uh, of that new version. So canary releases can happen in different ways. So you can use, for example, dark launches where um, you have a new version of your application um, deployed and you could potentially do m traffic mirroring. So you're going to duplicate the traffic between you know, the end users who are still going to your first version, but you're going to duplicate that traffic and also send it to your second version so you can see exactly how it behaves under production load, but your end users are not seeing it because they're going to your version one. Um, now, of course, you know if you have some sort of version uh, some schema changes or something, well, keep that in mind because that might be an issue, but, you know, but this is a strategy that's pretty good at seeing you know, how uh, applications, uh, new versions uh, behave on, um, on production. Um, or you can do you know, dark canaries, you can use feature flags where you can say, hey, if uh, somebody has a specific user agent or something, then they can use uh, our second version. Um, so you can have, for example, a specific user uh, from your company that can test it out, or you know, uh, something like that. Um, so I was uh, I was at this uh, other conference uh, recently, and um, you know, it was uh, we were talking about uh, testing, and uh, and Victor here was saying, you know, this production code has four lines of code, and we're writing 20 lines full of mocks to be able to test these four lines of uh, of of code. That's kind of insane, right? To to be able to write that many mocks and they're unreliable because we're setting up a fake uh, world and, and with a lot of assumptions, right? So, you know, maybe if it's so complicated to test something on production or that is uh, production code, then maybe we should just test it on production, right? Maybe don't tell your business users that you're doing that. They, they might not be so comfortable with that, but you can actually effectively use uh, production as Kind of a new testing environment, uh, so you know you know the, the the testing pyramid, which does not look like a pyramid at all here. Sorry, <laughs> um, but you know, so you have your testing, you have your unit tests, and blah blah blah. You're still doing that. You definitely should still do that, um, and uh, you're doing all that in pre-production. But then you can use production to do stuff like you know low testing, uh, configuration testing of you know what's happening on production. Uh, and then use you know canarying and everything uh, for releasing, and then you know even after you release to production, your testing should continue. You should continue to monitor how everything is going. You know what kind of errors are are happening or not. What uh, what is the load that my my applications are producing? Is there some optimization that should have happened in my application? And then we can continue in that uh, inner and outer loop cycle to optimize our applications, right? So we want to continue definitely testing on production, not just you know whether there are errors, but also you know making sure that our application is optimized. Um, so okay, this all sounds good. Progressive delivery sounds pretty cool that uh, that we can do that. So how can we do that? Um, well, it's a lot easier with, uh, with Kubernetes, of course, because you, know, you have services, you have deployments, you know, it's very easy to scale out and do rolling releases and everything. So that's what uh, we're going to be focusing on. So a blue-green deployment, you can do that you know, pretty easy with uh, Kubernetes. You can just have a service that points to a certain uh, selector, uh, a certain deployment. And then uh, if you want to point it to a different deployment, then you just basically update that selector and your service is pointing to your new deployment. And then if you want to roll back, you just update your service to point at your previous version. So that's uh, pretty easy to do. 
You can do uh, canary releases with Kubernetes, but it becomes a little more complicated already because, uh, you, well, you can have services point to different deployments at the same time and then scale up uh, the replicas of a specific deployment. And, uh, you know, but that's kind of a manual uh, step, right, to scale um, our applications using this technique. Yes, you can automate it in some way, but it's not very, you know, robust and elegant. So um, Istio, for example, is a project that allows you to do this in a little more, um, in a more controlled way and a more automated way. So uh, Istio is, a, is an implementation of, of a service mesh. So, um, and this is an example, right? So you can use other uh, solutions as well. In my case, I'm using uh, Istio. So controlling uh, your, your microservices with the service mesh is pretty nice because it has a central control plane uh, where you can define, you know, like uh, how much traffic should go to this version, how much traffic should go to this version, filter traffic between versions. Um, you can do traffic mirroring. You can define that with, uh, with the service mesh. You can even do chaos testing. You can Im inject, you know, certain threshold. You can say in 1% in of all my uh, requests, inject a 500 error to see how it actually behaves in production if there's an error. And then you can use, again, our production environment as a real testing environment to see what happens if there's an issue. And you're in control, right? Because you're in control of the, the chaos testing. Um, you can do a bunch more things with uh, service mesh, but you know, we don't have time. And service mesh isn't necessarily a focus of this talk. Just uh, uh, showing you here the architecture, which has the control plane, and then a proxy that is tightly coupled with your container that externalizes the, the network uh, traffic so that you don't have to define it in uh, in your particular pods. Um, so with Istio, with the service mesh, we can define our canary releases. So we have a virtual service in this case, and we can say, hey, 75% uh, of my traffic should go to version one, and 25% should go to my version two. And so that's how you can control it and you know update it accordingly. You can do shadowing traffic also, kind of with a similar definition, so you can say, hey, uh, send traffic to my version one and mirror it to, uh, to version two. And then you can do dark uh, canaries. So you can say, for example, hey, my uh, uh, Alexandra, you can test our new version uh, with your user agent, uh, Alexandra. If that matches, then we're going to send traffic to version two. Everybody else still uses uh, version one. So that's uh, cool with uh, Istio that you can do that, but here we're still needing to apply our definitions manually, right? We would commit them to Git, and it would be automatically uh, with GitOps uh, mitigated, but it's still kind of a manual step here. So what if we can automate this and create progressive delivery in an automated way? So that's uh, where the project Argo Rollouts uh, comes into play to be able to do that you know, in an automated way. So Argo Rollouts works, for example, with Istio, um, works with Argo CD. Um, you can also use Nginx or uh, traffic um, to, you know, do to your traffic routing as well. And so basically it's going to create a way to uh, define steps to deploy and then potentially look at uh, a monitoring stack such as Prometheus uh, to, def to deploy your application and to see, you know, whether metrics are good to continue going through those steps. So here's an example of, uh, of one of those rollouts. So you can see we have different steps. So you can see strategy, canary, and then set weight 20. So that's 20% of our traffic uh, to our canary version, to our new version. And we're going to wait one minute. So you see that duration, one minute. And then uh, once that minute is up and uh, I haven't rolled it back, then we're going to release it to 50% of our traffic in this case, right? And then we're going to wait again two minutes. In the real world, you probably want to wait a little longer than one minute or two minutes. This is, you know, more for uh, for uh, my demo. Um, but so you can release uh, you can release automatically in steps uh, without having to intervene manually. So it's going to update our virtual services automatically to uh, to match with our definition. So that's pretty cool. But I still have to. Um, when something happens, I have to monitor and then roll back uh, myself, right? Because uh, there's not an automated way to do that yet. 
So what if we could do that? What, what if we could make our smart progressive delivery uh, smart based on metrics? So I call this smart progressive delivery. I don't know if this is a term that anybody else uses. Um, but so basically, we're going to make our progressive delivery smart in a sense that it's going to check for metrics itself and, and, and for itself decide whether this release is going well or not, and then roll back if, uh, if it needs to. So you can use that with Argo rollouts. You can create an analysis step, uh, point that to a different uh, definition, which is uh, um, called a success rate in this case. And uh, here we see the analysis template that is also part of the Argo rollout spec. And we can see that it matches. And so here I can define my success means that you know every 10 seconds, I'm going to check in my metrics to see if uh, uh, my threshold of 95% success rate uh, is good based on a specific uh, rules that I, that I define. So in this case, I'm using Prometheus. You can use other monitoring stacks as well. Um, I like you know open source projects, so uh, this uh, Prometheus is of course uh, open source, and you can see I'm uh, checking for 500 errors over the last 30 seconds. So if I look in Prometheus for my application for my Canary release, and I have uh, more than 5% uh, 500 errors in my in my monitoring stack, then please stop rolling out and roll back. So that's kind of the idea. Uh, of of uh, doing the smart uh, progressive delivery. So my demo, uh, I'm gonna just going to show a video because we're running a little bit out of time, and otherwise I think I'm going to take a little too long. So I've prepared a little video that we can play. And so here we can see um, I'm changing the version from uh, blue to green. I'm showing these little bubbles um, that are changing color. So the original version is blue. And I'm going to commit this. So my new release is a, a green version of these bubbles, right? And so I'm going to, uh, you can see here in Argo, uh, I have my application. Uh, it's being applied. And we can see here on the left side, the revision uh, up top there. So you see pods running with revision 21. That's the previous version. And then we can see there's new pods being created for my new version. So I'm slowly creating new traffic, which is causing my bubbles to be green, right? So those are the new version that's being released. So we see the, ma the majority of our version is still uh, using the blue version. And we can see, actually, uh, there's some errors happening. So I injected some errors. And you can see here, uh, here you can see the X3 here. So my analysis run is uh, checking in Prometheus and noticing that hey, there's too many errors happening with this. So uh, I set my threshold to say, after two of those analysis runs, if the third one fails, then please roll back to my previous version. Oh, it's lunchtime. We got a notification. <laughs> um, and uh, so we can see now that we're still we're going back to all blue bubbles. So let's say that I now fixed everything, and I'm going to retry my rollout. So here you can see I'm doing an Argo uh, rollouts retry. And so we're going to retry, and you know, let's say that I fixed my, uh, my bug that I had thanks to Argo rollouts. It noticed that there were issues, and it rolled back automatically. So the impact was pretty small. Only a few people got affected with a, with a, blue or, um, with a green bubble that had some errors. So now we're re-releasing our feature with fixes. And so you can see after a small delay, because first I need to gather some metrics in my Prometheus, so we can see now that there's an analysis run happening, and we can see the green check mark. So now it's uh, seeing that there are no more errors happening, and it's going to continue to release uh, our application. And you can see here the set weight is changing as this is rolling out. And so more containers are being created uh, that point to our new version. And so gradually, we see that there are more green bubbles uh, appearing on the screen until at some point, we have 100% of our desired uh, um, traffic is going to, one, to our new version, and everything is green now. So our release happened. Everything was good. Our metrics look good. Everything is solid. And after a delay of, you know, in this case, I've defined it to 30 seconds, where my previous version is still there if I do need to roll back. Um, after, you know, that delay, five, four, three, to one, you see it here. 
uh, now I'm going to tear down the old containers of my previous version because I don't need them anymore. I'm fully on my new version. And that's uh, how we can do a progressive uh, delivery of our applications with uh, Argo rollouts. So uh, some final notes, of course, you know, when you're releasing a new feature and you're gradually shifting your traffic, of course, you know, if you have some sort of state behind it and you have a difference of versioning with schemas, of course, keep that in mind, you know, uh, there, there, there's some considerations to be taken there. Um, the idea is to really go step by step, embrace GitOps, uh, and if you haven't automatically destroyed something by mistake, then uh, you're not automating enough. Uh, you see uh, some links for the demos here, so um, I'll share the slides as well. I'll put them on my Twitter because I haven't uh, created the slides on Speaker Deck yet, so um, I'll, I'll share my Twitter in a little bit. If you want to play around with, uh, with OpenShift, you can uh, get a free instance uh, with the OpenShift Sandbox, so you can play around with some of the features uh, that I showed. Um, if you want to learn more about, uh, about GitOps. This is a book that uh, my colleagues Natale and, uh, and Alex wrote, uh, which you can download for free. You just I, Maybe you need to create uh, a free account on developers.redhat.com, which is pretty cool too, because you get a ton of resources, tutorials, and, uh, and demos and everything about this kind of stuff. Uh, and also you know, Java development and everything, because uh, that's my wheelhouse. Uh, so yeah, definitely join the developers.redhat.com if you haven't yet. And uh, with that, I'm going to say thank you for joining me. And then uh, I'll uh, share my Twitter real quick in case anybody wants the slides, because I forgot to post them. So I'll un uh, hide this slide and skip slide. There we go. And so if you need it, uh, you find the information right here. So hopefully this was interesting to you. If you have any questions, I think I have a few minutes for uh, questions. And if not, you can find me. I'll be at the, at the booth there, the Red Hat booth, in a little bit for uh, questions as well. Any questions? Yes. I don't know if there's a micro. Let's see if I can answer it. So you, you show the um, Argo CD rollouts, but you, you execute a command manually. Can you integrate that directly with the uh, Argo CD process, like by committing somewhere something? Yeah. Um, did I do something manually? I don't remember. And it was a uh, kubectl Argo rollout. Uh. Oh, no, so, uh, oh, the retry. That was to do the retry. Yeah, so um, you could just release your new feature. So you can maybe, if there's an issue with your container image, you can push a new version of your container image, and that would trigger everything to be rolled out again as a new revision, which that works as well too, because then you can see in uh, in Git. In my case, I I did a retry, and actually, if I did make a change um, in uh, in my application, I probably would have made that change and pushed it to my Git repository anyway. So this was just like for uh, demo purposes to make it real quick. So yeah, it would be it would be automated. Um, and then you know, just a quick correction, if, if I might, because you called it Argo CD rollouts. So it's just Argo rollouts, because it's under the Argo umbrella. But Argo CD is a project under Argo, and then Argo rollouts is another project. I mean, I'm sure you know this, but yeah. Any other questions? All right. So um, find me at the booth if you have any more questions, or you can just come up here. And then uh, thank you for, for joining me.